Good day. I am David Frizzell, and I am presenting a slideshow called An Introduction to Amateur Astronomy. We at the Albuquerque Astronomical Society are participating in this year's virtual Cosmic Carnival through the auspices of the Albuquerque Open Space Visitor Center. The Albuquerque Astronomical Society, or TAS, or T-A-A-S, is one of the largest astronomy clubs in the country. We have over 300 active members. We have a private observatory, a number of telescopes that we lend to our members. We also have an active educational and public outreach program. We have a number of ways that we share the science and the fun of astronomy. And our motto is, observe, educate, and have fun. You can find out about our activities and schedules at our website and Facebook page. I'll give more details about that at the end of this discussion. Astronomy is a natural science that studies celestial objects and phenomena in order to explain the origin, evolution, and phenomena of such things as planets, moons, stars, nebulae, galaxies, and comets. Generally, ast astronomy studies everything that originates outside Earth's atmosphere. Amateur astronomy is one of those few sciences where amateurs play an active role. It's also an activity where the participants enjoy both observing and imaging celestial objects using everything from the naked eye to binoculars to telescopes and digital cameras. We attend lectures and educate ourselves about astronomy, and we teach students and the public about astronomy. Although careful observers made detailed observations of the motions of the planets and the stars uh, before the invention of the telescope, we commonly think of astronomy as getting the greatest advance with the discovery of the telescope in about 1608. It is generally conceded that Galileo was the first person to start using the telescope to study the sky. Galileo's telescope was fairly small and his glass lenses were poor quality by today's standards, but he was able to observe some things and make detailed drawings that shook up the establishment. Many of you probably know that Galileo got in trouble with the Catholic Church for, among other reasons, his drawings of the imperfections of the moon's surface, some of which you can see on this slide. Turning to the present, there is a bewildering collection of types of telescopes and equipment and mounts, along with accessories that amateurs can make or purchase. For practical purposes, there are three main types of visual telescopes, one using lenses, one uh, and we call that a refractor. One using mirrors, we call that a reflector, and one combining the two, uh, called a catadioptric or sometimes a schmidt cassegrain telescope. Refractors use objective lenses to bend the light rays to a focus at the eyepiece. Because grinding the lenses is a fairly difficult process, the lenses are usually not very large, and as you can see in these pictures, most refractors are mounted on a tripod in a configuration that allows for a motor or clock drive to move the telescope to keep up with the Earth's rotation. On average, refractors are relatively expensive for the amount of aperture, that is the diameter of the lenses, that is available. However, a good refractor shows a sharp image and is especially good for views of the moon and planets. Reflectors use mirrors to collect the light and focus it at the eyepiece. The light rays reflect off the primary mirror at the back of the telescope and then are reflected off a flat secondary mirror that is much smaller than the primary mirror and the light rays are then focused at the eyepiece. The mirrors have the advantage of being easier to grind and the telescopes have the advantage of being about half the length of a comparable refractor. So reflectors are usually less expensive for their aperture than are refractors. Small refract reflectors can be mounted on a tripod, but larger reflectors are usually mounted closer to the ground 
on a mount called an alt as or altitude azimuth mount. The combination scope, usually called a Schmidt Cassegrain scope by amateurs, uses a special type of lens at the front of the telescope and has a special shape that allows the maker of the primary mirror to cast it with a hole in the center. So the light rays pass through the front lens to the primary mirror. The light rays are then reflected to a secondary mirror attached to the front lens. And the light rays are finally reflected out through the hole in the primary mirror to the eyepiece. And this allows for a still shorter telescope. They are more expensive than standard reflectors and often are the most expensive telescopes available to amateurs. It's fair to say that all Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes are mounted on forks, and the forks are usually operated in the Alt As configuration. Today, most amateurs use reflectors, and most amateurs employ a, var a variation of the Alt As mount. Even when the base of the telescope is low to the ground, you can get a motor drive with computer assisted functions. Further, with new materials and designs, even large telescopes are fairly portable. Now you have probably heard of magnification. In rough terms, that refers to how much bigger something looks in the eyepiece than it looks in the sky. But for telescopes, the more important consideration is aperture. That is, in rough terms, the size of the objective lens or mirror. The larger the aperture, the more light rays you can gather and that means the more light you can focus down to the eyepiece. For comparison, we sometimes call the refractor telescope, the one with the lenses, a light thimble. And we sometimes call the reflector telescope, the one with the mirror, a light bucket. To give you a direct example, my largest telescope, for example, has a mirror that is 22 inches in diameter and has a motor drive and a built-in computer. Nonetheless, I can take it to various observing sites such as the Florida Keys Winter Star Party that I attended in 2015. And this picture was in the St. Augustine newspaper. I can pack the telescope parts, various hardware and camping equipment in my Prius V. What can we see in our celestial neighborhood? Well, our neighborhood might start with our solar system, our sun, planet, and moons, and Sometimes we also can do some observing with asteroids and, if we're lucky, some comets. Our local address is in the Milky Way galaxy, and you've probably heard that there are literally billions of galaxies. The Milky Way is one of over 54 galaxies in what we call the local group. And three of these are very large. Andromeda, which we think is bigger than ours, our Milky Way, which would be the second biggest, and Triangulum. There are other dwarf galaxies mostly clustered around these three large galaxies. In terms of scale, the local group is about 10 million light years across. Professional astronomers and even some amateurs don't stop there. Our local group is on the outskirts of something we call the Virgo supercluster, and it has at least 100 galaxy groups and clusters with an estimated diameter of 110 million light years. The next groups from there really do require specialized professional hardware, so I won't be talking about them. You don't need much magnification or aperture to see the details of the moon. You should prepare yourself, however, for how bright the moon is. Unless you use some special filters, if you observe the moon, you won't be able to see much else for a while until your eyes restore their sensitivity. And that may take as long as 20 or 30 minutes. We always give uh, information about safety at any discussion about the sun. Never look directly at the sun without correct hardware. Do not use an eyepiece filter on a telescope to look at the sun. While there are special objective lenses that are acceptable, TAS recommends that you limit your solar viewing to either certified eclipse glasses or specialized solar telescopes. Let's turn to the planets in our solar system. 
in a modest uh, amateur instrument, you can see such things as the phases of Venus, storms and ice caps on Mars, bands, storms, the great eye and moon transits on Jupiter, and at different times of the year, you can see various angles and shadows of the rings of Saturn. Amateurs usually refer to objects outside our solar system as items in the deep sky. In a medium to large aperture telescope, you can see objects that are much further away and much more massive than the items in our solar system. At this point, I need to let you know that these pictures that you see in this slide are the result of hours of imaging. And what you will see at the eyepiece is different. I will explain that a bit more later in the program. To understand how we find things in the sky, it helps to understand a little bit about our relative locations in the solar system and in the Milky Way galaxy. When we look at the sky at night, it appears that we are inside a large ball or sphere covered in stars. The celestial sphere is an abstract sphere around the Earth. All objects in the sky can be conceived as being projected upon the inner surface of the celestial sphere. From the point of view of an observer, half of the sphere would resemble a hemispherical screen over the observing location. Astronomers use an equatorial coordinate system that divides the sphere into two halves, the northern and southern celestial hemisphere. Another part of the way that we measure things is by considering our orbit around the sun. Our major planets orbit the sun in a pretty flat disk. Poor Pluto does not orbit in that plane. That's part of the reason Pluto was demoted. The ecliptic is the narrow perspective of the plane or of just the Earth's orbit around the sun. So from the perspective of an observer on Earth, the sun's movement around the celestial sphere over the course of a year traces out a path along what we call the ecliptic against the background of stars. Relative to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, the Earth is tilted on its axis about 23 and a half degrees. Like our solar system, the Milky Way is also shaped as a disk. And our sun is about two thirds of the way from the center to the edge of the galaxy. While modern astronomers can locate objects by several approaches, such as using the coordinate system or GPS signals and computer programs, I want to point out that it's really useful to learn the constellation based pattern recognition system, both because you can find things, but also because it helps you to really learn the night sky. We'll start the discussion of patterns by reference to the constellations. Modern astronomy has divided the celestial sphere into a grid oriented around 88 star shapes called constellations. The ancient Greeks and Arabs were astute sky watchers. The Greeks used their imagination to observe how patterns emerged from the relationship of brighter stars. We call those patterns constellations. The Arabs were particularly good at identifying specific stars and naming them. In fact, we use many of their names today. Many of you will know that Ursa Major means the Great Bear, but most of you will know that a few stars in the Great Bear make the pattern or asterism that we call the Big Dipper. I will return to the Big Dipper in a moment. We moderns do not see the same details and star patterns that our ancestors thought they saw, such as this magnificent drawing of Orion and, and Taurus, the bull. However, even though we don't see as much in the patterns, as our ancestors thought they saw, those patterns are still useful. This modern asterism is part of, of what the Greeks identified as the Orion constellation and contains many stars that were named by the Arabs. 
Now let's turn to one of the patterns or asterisms we generally agree that we see. Here, of course, are the principal stars of the Big Dipper. It's a little easier to see it as a dipper if we connect the dots. I've learned that some of the younger members of my audience don't actually recognize a dipper. So here is a picture of one. You probably know or realize that the stars of the Big Dipper are actually at various distances from us. But since they appear on the inner surface of the celestial sphere, they seem to be at about the same distance. The point is that because the Big Dipper is so easy to identify, here you can use it uh, to find a lot of other asterisms or constellations as this diagram shows. Now, besides these guideposts of the constellations and their asterisms, there are a number of other ways that amateurs can find things similar to what professionals now use. There are computer programs and star charts, most of which are not expensive and some of the computer programs are actually free. Wrapping up the discussion about how to find things, some of the popular astronomy magazines have foldouts of the major items for that month, as well as discussions of techniques for locating hard to find targets. Now, earlier I said that there was a difference between what you can see at the eyepiece of a telescope compared to what you can actually see in a digital image taken through a telescope. This is partly a function of the way the light arriving at the rods and cones of our eyes can only stimulate a certain amount of neurotransmitters, but a digital image can multiply that data many times. So while you can expect that you might see something similar to the top picture uh, because of all the digital images out there and because it's almost possible to spot this item in the sky without a telescope, you would think that if you set up your modest 10 inch reflector in your backyard, you might get a pretty good picture. But what you see is maybe about what you see in this, this image here. The light is spread out so thinly that it may not show much detail and certainly won't show any color, at least for the usual galaxy image. Some of my friends call this just a piece of lint. So to get some of these beautiful images like you see here, takes hours of exposure and probably lots of post-processing using computer programs like Adobe or similar programs which are now being made exclusively for amateurs and their digital cameras. There are some exceptions to the difference between the digital image and what you see in the telescope, such as the ring nebula, which actually does look quite a bit like a ring and may actually appear to have a little bit of greenish or bluish color in a telescope, but mostly it looks like a smoke ring. I suggested that what you see in a, with regard to galaxies is a little bit like a piece of lint, but if you do look at a good sized galaxy with a telescope with pretty good aperture, after a while, particularly if you avert your eyes just a bit from time to time, and by that I mean look off to the side just a little bit, you should be able to start seeing such things as a brighter core and at least some spiral arms. And this view does continue to improve with larger and larger apertures. One of my favorite telescope top objects in the eyepiece is the Orion Nebula. You won't see color, but you will certainly see the shape of the greater part of the nebula, as well as the four bright trapezium stars that are generating most of that illumination. Cut. Uh, another piece uh, of history. The Crab Nebula is one of the most famous nebula for several reasons, but it's not very exciting in an eyepiece. Just know that the nova that created it was probably seen and appreciated by people over the world in 1054. Many of you in New Mexico know that the people of Chaco Canyon left a pictograph of what we've now believe was their observation of the Nova. One kind of deep sky item that 
does look like its picture is star clusters, particularly globular clusters. Globular clusters are big balls of stars and they are gorgeous in an eyepiece. One of my favorite experiences was having a small child look through the eyepiece at a globular cluster and exclaim to me that it looked like a bunch of broken glass shards. So let's say that you are getting interested in amateur astronomy and, and you start to wonder about using some hardware such as a telescope or a special camera. You probably wonder how much should you spend and, and what should you buy? Here is a sample of some prices for some items such as a medium-sized reflector, a top-of-the-line eyepiece, a modest schmidt cassegrain telescope, and a computer program. You can see that this could get expensive before you even know for sure that amateur astronomy is something you want to participate in. And if you really wanted to commit so that you could have a special dark observing site with a private observatory, uh, you can see now that you really have to start scratching your head and wondering about the cost of getting into this amateur activity. So here's where I make a pitch for joining the Albuquerque Astronomical Society. As a member, you will have access to the club's observatory. The club has a number of telescopes to lend as well as several telescopes at the observatory site. The observatory site has imaging hardware and the club has mentors to help you learn about astronomy and the hardware. You could start to learn about amateur astronomy without spending a lot of money and becoming familiar with the types of instruments that might appeal to you for $30 a year. And here's just a thumbnail sketch of many of the benefits of joining TAS. It's easy to join TAS and get an idea of our schedule at our website. I hope you'll check us out there and I'd like to see you, even if it's only just by Zoom for now, at our next general meeting. Have a good day. And keep looking up.